Hi, I'm Norman Fenton. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today. What I'm going to focus on is the role of the likelihood ratio in analysing the probative value of DNA evidence. I'm going to motivate this discussion of the likelihood ratio by considering a topical example of an accurate test for COVID-19. I'm not suggesting that such tests exist, but that's good enough for the example. We're going to assume that the test has a 1% false negative rate. What that means is that for every 100 people with COVID-19, there'll only be one who wrongly tests negative, but 99 will correctly test positive. And that there's a 2% false positive rate. So that means that out of every 100 people who don't have COVID-19, there'll only be two who wrongly test positive. 98 will correctly test negative. Let's suppose that Sarah takes a test and tests positive. What does that tell us about the probability that she has the virus? What the likelihood ratio does is tell us about the probative value of that evidence. Well, let's have a look at how the likelihood ratio is defined and what it can tell us about that type of evidence. Well, let H be the hypothesis that the person has the virus. This is the hypothesis whose probability is unknown and for which we want to know how much the evidence tells us about it. So the evidence E in this case is the positive test result. What we know is the following, that the probability of E given H is 0.99 because the probability that we would get a positive test result if the person has the virus is 99%. The probability of E given not H, so the probability of getting that evidence if the person doesn't have the virus is 0.02 because that's the false positive rate of 2%. The likelihood ratio is simply defined as the ratio of this number, probability of E given H, divided by this number, probability of E given not H. So in this case, that's 0.99 divided by 0.02 which is 49.5, so it's approximately a likelihood ratio of 50. But what does that mean? Well, this means that we're nearly 50 times more likely to see a positive test result in a person who has the disease compared to a person who doesn't have the disease. And that seems to be quite convincing evidence. But what does it actually tell us about the probability that the person has the virus? Well, unfortunately, unless we know the prior probability of H, which is written as P of H, then the likelihood ratio alone doesn't determine the posterior probability of H, which we write as P of H given E, or like this, and that's the revised probability given the evidence. Let's suppose that Sarah has no symptoms and that it's estimated that the current population infection rate for such people is 1 over 200 then the prior probability for H in this case is 1 over 200. And in this case, we can actually show that the posterior, i.e. the revised probability once you get the evidence, is actually only about 20%. And yet most people, when presented with such information, wrongly assume it must be close to 100%. In fact, there's been numerous experiments, particularly when uh, medical experts are presented with similar scenarios, massively overestimate the posterior probability when given that type of evidence. Now, I could prove all this with Bayes' theorem, but rather than show you Bayes' theorem as a formula, I'm going to demonstrate this using a population diagram. So let's suppose that we've got a thousand people who are randomly tested. So these are people who are asymptomatic, and so we assume that the population infection rate for these is 1 in 200, and of course that will mean that about 5 will actually have the virus. And given the 99% true positive test accuracy, we can assume that all of those five are going to test positive. The remaining 995 don't have COVID, but the problem is, of those 995 who don't have COVID, that small percentage, that 2%, are going to test positive. But that's about 20 people. So that's 20 people without COVID testing positive. So if we focus now only on those who test positive then we've got 25 in total. But only five of those actually have the virus. So only one in five of those who test positive have the virus. So the posterior probability Sarah has the virus is about 20%. And that was actually a visual explanation of Bayes' theorem. Well, in order to use the likelihood ratio as a measure of probative value, then we actually have to use Bayes' theorem. And what Bayes' theorem tells us, and this is the so-called odds version of Bayes' theorem, is that the posterior odds of H are just the 
prior odds of h times the likelihood ratio. Now, the interesting thing here is this is expressed as odds rather than probability. The odds is simply the probability of h against the probability of not h the negation of h. And that's very important because Bayes' theorem relies on considering h against its negation. And we'll come back to that in a minute. It's because of Bayes' theorem and only because of Bayes' theorem that the likelihood ratio can be considered meaningfully to measure the probative value of evidence. To see why, suppose h is the prosecution hypothesis, so not h is the defence hypothesis then a likelihood ratio greater than 1 means E supports H, and the bigger it is, the more it supports H. Because if it's greater than 1, the posterior odds must be greater than the prior odds. And that also means that the probability of H has increased as a result of seeing the evidence. A likelihood ratio of less than 1 means that the evidence supports the defence hypothesis, because in this case, the posterior odds in favour of H must go down, they must decrease, which also means that the posterior probability of H has decreased as a result of seeing the evidence. And the likelihood ratio of 1 means that the evidence has no probative value at all, because in this case, the posterior odds are unchanged. Your belief in H is unchanged as a result of seeing the evidence E. So let's look at the likelihood ratio in the context of our virus testing example. So in this case, think of the prosecutor hypothesis as the hypothesis that H has the virus and the defence hypothesis that she doesn't have the virus. So the prior odds were about 200 to 1 in favour of the defence. The likelihood ratio was 50. The posterior odds, therefore, are 1 to 4 in favour of the defence. So it's still unlikely, it's only a 20% chance, that she has the virus. But if before having the test, the prior odds on Sarah having the virus were something like only two to one against, maybe because we know, for example, that she's got some symptoms and that she's been in contact with somebody who has proven positive. Then when presented with the evidence of a positive test in this case, the posterior odds now are 25 to one in favor of her having the virus. So it's completely changed We've got the same likelihood ratio, but completely different priors for H produce effectively the opposite outcomes. There are some good things about the likelihood ratio. It is a simple formula for probative value of evidence. There isn't any need to explicitly consider the prior for H in order to get the likelihood ratio. And of course, lawyers like that because they don't like, especially forensic experts, expressing judgments, especially subjective judgments about probability of H. It also forces experts to consider the probability of the evidence under both the prosecution and defence hypotheses. And because of that, that's known to be quite an effective way of avoiding the so-called prosecutor's fallacy. But the problem is none of these are exactly what they seem in practice. And that's because the likelihood ratio only works as a measure of probative value when the defence is the negation of the prosecution hypothesis i.e. we say that the hypotheses are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. And that's because Bayesian relies on the assumption that we're comparing H against not H. In fact, as the accompanying paper shows by providing actual examples, it turns out that if the hypotheses are not mutually exclusive and exhaustive, then it's actually possible for the likelihood ratio to be greater than 1, but the evidence actually supports the defence hypothesis. And similarly, the likelihood ratio can be less than 1, but the evidence can support the prosecution hypothesis. And similarly, we can have a likelihood ratio equal to one, but the evidence can still be probative. And of course, this is bad because when DNA evidence is used with the likelihood ratio, typically the prosecution hypothesis is that DNA from the crime scene belongs to the defendant, and they take the defence hypothesis to be that DNA from the crime scene belongs to a person unrelated to the defendant. And the problem is, of course, that these hypotheses are not exhaustive. And as an extreme example, consider the case where the defendant has a twin, and let's suppose that the DNA found at the crime scene matches the defendant's, and that that DNA has a 1 over 1,000 random match probability. So in this case, if we assume a 50-50 prior for the prosecution hypothesis that the DNA came from the defendant against some other unrelated person, then the posterior probability, once we find the match, 
is highly probative. It goes from 50% to 99.9%. But when we consider the possibility that it could have come from the defendant's twin, so we've actually got three hypotheses here, then the evidence is slightly probative in favour of H because it's increased from a 33% prior to a 49.9% posterior. But of course it's not probative when considered against the twin. If our only hypotheses were the defendant against the defendant's twin, then finding the DNA match provides no probative value. The probabilities are unchanged when we enter the evidence. Well, how convincing is a very high likelihood ratio when you've got non-exhaustive hypotheses? Well, it may not be convincing at all. Let's suppose that I come home and I discover that a lovely vase which had been standing in the middle of my dining room table is on the floor and it's broken. Nothing else in the house is broken, no sign of breaking, etc. So that's my evidence. I've got two hypotheses here. The first, which we call HP, is that burglars broke in. And the second is that there was an earthquake. The probability of finding this evidence if burglars broke in is pretty low, say 1 in 100. Because if they did, it would be very unlikely that the only damage or loss you'd see is a single broken vase. But the probability of seeing this evidence if it was an earthquake is unbelievably low, say 1 in 100,000. Because if it was an earthquake, it's almost impossible that a vase would be shaken from the middle of the table, but no other damage was done. So in this case, the likelihood ratio for the burglary hypothesis is very high, 1,000. And an expert would conclude this evidence strongly supports the burglary hypothesis because it's a thousand times more likely than the alternative. But the it here is ambiguous. People naturally assume it refers to the burglary hypothesis rather than the evidence. Also, because the prior probability of the burglary hypothesis is much higher than the earthquake hypothesis, surely we must conclude that the posterior probability of the burglary is almost certain. But it almost certainly isn't. I forgot that I have a cat at home. So there you can see the danger of reading too much into a high likelihood ratio, especially for non-exhaustive hypotheses. The worst part is that even if the hypotheses are exhaustive, a very high likelihood ratio tells us nothing about the probability of the prosecution hypothesis being true. And while that's a little bit problematic for a single profile DNA evidence, it's actually catastrophic, but not widely understood as such, for mixed-profile DNA evidence. Let's suppose that the mixed DNA sample from the crime scene looks like this, and let's suppose the suspect's DNA is this. Now, for simplicity, we're going to assume that we know that the mixed sample is exactly a two-person sample. Then let's look at the possible pairs of contributor profiles that match the crime scene mixture. If there is a contributor with DNA profile matching the defendants, then the two contributors must have these profiles. And of course, this one includes the defendant. But we could have mixtures like this. Contributor 1 is that, contributor 2 is that. And in this case, the suspect cannot possibly be a contributor. Here's another. And another, etc. All of these possibilities exclude the suspect's DNA profile. And they're just as likely as any that include it. And of course, there are many more such combinations like this. And that's why a high likelihood ratio for a mixed profile match is completely different to a high likelihood ratio for a single profile match. Suppose we have a likelihood ratio of over 10 billion for a single profile match. Then even if our prior belief that it comes from the suspect is one over the world population, like one over seven billion, there would still be a greater than 50% posterior probability. So the evidence is incredibly probative in this case, but that's for a single profile match. If the suspect's alleles are included on every locus of a mixed profile, then while it certainly will lead to an astronomically high likelihood ratio, the posterior probability that a person is a contributor is theoretically very low, and I can explain that by giving an example with coloured balls. So imagine that everybody carries three coloured balls, which are yellow, red and blue, with numbers 0 to 9. And suppose that Fred's profile is that. So his yellow ball has a number 1, his red ball has a number 2, his blue ball has a number 3. Now let's, let's suppose that two people throw their balls into a box. And those are the balls. 
We want to know whether Fred's balls are in that box. Well, if Fred's profile was in the box, then that would mean that the other profile in the box must be a yellow 7, a red 8, and a blue 9. And in that case, we would conclude that Fred's profile was in the box. Now, the likelihood ratio for the hypothesis that Fred plus one unknown are the contributors versus the hypothesis of two unknown contributors is 166, which is quite high. But of course, Fred's profile is not in this mixture. It's not in that mixture. It's not in that mixture. And each of those combinations is equally likely to be the mixture as the one that includes Fred's profile. So the posterior probability that Fred's profile is in the mixture is only one in four. So it's actually unlikely that Fred's profile is in that mixture despite the high likelihood ratio. In fact, things are even more confusing because this is simply the probability that his profile is in the mixture. What's the probability that it actually came from Fred? Well, even if his profile was in there, then that one, two, three could have come from Fred. It could have come from Pete, who had the same profile. It could have come from anybody with the same profile. So there's only one in four probability his profile is in the mixture. And even then, he's no more likely to be the contributor with that profile than possibly many others. So saying that the evidence that Fred is a contributor is 166 times more likely than he is not is both misleading and wrong. And of course, you can extend this to four coloured balls, and it gets even more ridiculous. Again, two people throw their balls into a box. It's possible that his profile is in that mixture, but it's not in any of these. In fact, there's only one out of eight possible combinations of contributors, which include Fred's profile. In this case, the likelihood ratio for the hypothesis that Fred's profile plus one unknown of the contributors versus the hypothesis of two unknowns as the contributors, is 714. But the posterior probability of his profile being in the mixture is only one out of eight. And of course, things are even more uncertain. For low template mixtures, matches may be reported for very few loci. We get the common cause of stochastic effects, which are not taken into account. We can never be sure of the number of different contributors. The hypotheses are not exhaustive for two reasons, both the unrelated person issue and the number of contributors issue. So when an expert reports that it's a billion times more likely to obtain the DNA results if the suspect is a contributor than if he is not, what the expert should report is that if we could be certain that there were exactly two contributors to this mixture, then it's a billion times more likely that we'd obtain the DNA results if the suspect is a contributor than if two people unrelated to the suspect were the contributors. However, in the absence of any other evidence, it's still very unlikely that anybody matching the suspect's DNA profile is even in the mixture at all. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you.